All right. So I'm going to transition. We have a lot of content. We'll go on break in about 15 minutes, but I'm going to go through as much as I can uh, in the next 15 minutes. So to get started, we'll uh, look at the uh, open PyXL assignment that was done uh, for week five. So you sort of understand maybe what I was trying to convey. Um, and I definitely appreciate the feedback because uh, every semester this course gets better. At least I think it does. Uh, let's see. All right, so for week five, there's, there was a one-line solution. And a lot of people actually tried the one-line solution, and that actually wasn't my intent. Uh, yeah. Uh, did I put it in here? Oh. Where did it go? All right. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> you may they not actually put it in. All right, so you have two data frames, right, and you can merge them together on a shared key. That was the one-line solution. However, it wasn't the actual solution because that one-line operation doesn't preserve the charts and formulas and formatting of Excel. And so why did I have you go through all this extra work of like moving around cells by cells in different data frames and there are different worksheets? The reason is because like typically you'll be working with people who are not comfortable using pandas or R or any like data transformation tools, they'll be using Excel. And that means in order to meet them where they are at, you have to be able to work with the data they have and give them back transformed data in the format they're used to working with. So to give it, hopefully, hopefully that was enough, but I want to reiterate, like if someone has an Excel spreadsheet and they give it to you and you just want to make transformations to it, then yes, pandas is the right solution. But if you want to have someone's Excel spreadsheet, make some transitions to it, and then give it back to them in the format that they're used to, then you have to use something like OpenPyXL. That was really the intent of the week five assignment, is that you don't want to disrupt the charts and formulas and formatting that they have in place. Uh, right, so, and I don't use Excel because Excel is very fragile. It doesn't have documentation, like you, you can break things and it's not very visible. So there's a lot of reasons not to use Excel. But that said, I've seen people who use Excel for 30 years, and they just, you know, they get promoted and everything else to it. So mm -hmm. there must be some merit to it. All right. Apparently, yeah. So I will share this solution. Um, and I, I think I, I don't have the, the. I was hoping to have the merge in here, but anyways, it's. I'll, I'll put it in here before I post it. All right. They don't have any questions on on the details on that, but. Sorry. Okay. So unfortunately, I don't have actual merge in here, and I don't know if I have. I'm gonna switch back over to not this one. What was the one line solution? Yeah, yeah. So the <laughs> that's what I'm saying. The one line solution is where did it go? Sorry, lost. <laughs> it's hard to get back on track here. Yeah, yeah. The one line solution solved the problem. That's what I'm trying to get to. <laughs> the one line false false solution. No. So <laughs> people who submitted. So this, this is the one line, right? Take these two data frames. On the left data frame, we'll merge on patient ID. And on the right data frame, we'll merge on PID. That results in the output structure that is appropriate, but it doesn't preserve any of the formatting or charts in the Excel. And how often? Huh? And so does the sign up for the, the like an SQL query? Yes, exactly. To join. Yeah. Yeah. And how SQL to open? Outer join. So right, this is a, a reasonable question. So like, if you uh, in a web browser type pandas merge join. There's a, there's a really good visual walkthrough. So merge, join, and concatenate. This is a, a whole web page on, suppose I've got a bunch of different data frames, and I want to combine them. Maybe I want to stack them. Maybe I want to put them side by side. Maybe I want to do a join operation. Like All these different things, they're visually walked through with very specific examples to see what the associated commands are. So 
This first one here, you're just stacking the data frames on top of each other. That's concat. And then you can do, uh, you can preserve the index. Yeah, you can, yeah. So there's a whole bunch of different logical operations you can do when putting different data frames together. And so this page is a very good tutorial of walking through how to do that. So the one that we're interested in down here, uh, should we merge at the bottom? Yeah. I can pull this up. There's a lot, right? I mean, like, I don't cover this in detail because it's very complicated. Like every SQL thing we can write in pandas. Or? In pandas, yeah. Same simplicity or? I don't know about sim simplicity. What do you mean by that? Yeah, it's like a one line. Actually, so we're we're gonna cover that today in lecture. We're actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. If we use this method, no. No. That's the point. So so the join gets the data structure right, but doesn't preserve any of the other things in Excel. So that one line It's a solution that gets you the data structure, but not the formatting. Yeah. Can we do anything to copy the formula later? Open PyXL. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I, I, I literally would, I would give you a better answer if I knew of it. So you would have done like, we did a separate data frame and using this approach, we have taken all the data into yeah. separate data frame and then copy it to separate Excel. Absolutely. <laughs> so the reason you could do not. Uh, okay, okay, so we've got a bunch of conversations going on. Okay. So I would like to get to everyone's conversation. Let's start with Pam. The, 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 the reason that you could uh, do not change the popular graph is because you don't want us to use that one line. Correct. Okay. So, so to Toto's point, you could merge the data with a join and then copy the formulas over, but then you might as well just copy the whole cell. Okay, so there were at least three other conversations. Do another one. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> I, like literally, I have activities where you guys talk to each other, but this isn't one of them. <laughs> All right. All right. If we didn't know each other, thanks to your, you know. I know. Right? This, we talk. I've introduced the problem. I, I recognize the problem. I've introduced y'all to each other, and y'all are very friendly with each other. That's good. It's bad. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm going to switch over to another notebook where I talk about the highlights of uh, from project one that I saw. Right. So the I guess question. No. Okay. <laughs> so the the first that I have for you is that rather than download your CSV data and then uh, load it into pandas, the easiest thing. Do, in my opinion, is just to read straight from the, the URL. So if you can do that, that's a recommendation. Um, the reason why I recommend that is because it allows better reproducibility of the experiment. So the danger is if someone, if you include your URL separate hyperlink, then someone has to go there and get the data and like load it into, into the end of the data frame. It may or may not work out. So the easiest way, so this is an example from uh, a Wikipedia page, and this has a read HTML. And like you can just load it in there, and then you don't have to worry about how to format it and get it into a CSV. You just read straight from the HTML. So that's like tip number one. Once you've done once you've done that, read the HTML takes a little bit of extra work because then you have to figure out which of the tables am I interested in. It turns out for this data set, it's just the first table in the list. So that's cool. We're done. Right. And then uh, the other confusing thing about this data set was there is a column called rank, but it turns out that it's just like an index associated with the table. It has nothing to do with the actual ranking of the rows. So that was the confusion there. Yeah. So then um, the other thing that I usually do is if I am working with a table, I will store it offline as a backup because sometimes web pages go away. Websites go down. Websites aren't yet available. Or, you know, maybe you don't have online access for whatever reason. So I save my data offline. So you could save it as a CSV, um, and then would be perfectly reasonable. I don't know if I've talked about Pickle before. Pickle is a format for taking a data structure in, in uh, Python, 
and saving it into a special Python-based format. And then it makes it very easy to read back in. So you don't lose any of the, uh, you know, if you, if you take your data frame and you put it into a CSV, there's some data loss in translation in that step. And so pickles is a way to store the actual in-memory object onto disk, and then you load it back in from disk onto memory. And so it's the exact data structure that you had. So pickles are a pretty good way of saving data in Python. Is there a way to read from a file? To do what? Read? Uh, read a CSV. Yes, I will. That's a leading question because here's the next example. <laughs> All right, so the question was, is there a way to read a CSV directly from a server? Because the, pre the first example is I had just read from a web page. Right? This one, it's a, it's a URL that points to a CSV. And we can just use read CSV. So Pandas is smart enough that if you point to a CSV on a server, it knows how to negotiate that link with the server and download it and load it in memory. Like, that is amazing. Just like, think of the complexity that happened behind the scenes in one line of a small command. All right, so I think that's all I had to point out on that one. Again, I just save that to a pickle. Mm, let's see. The, oh, okay. I need, for whatever reason, I interrupted my own calculation there. All right. So let's see if I can scroll down. Yeah. So this was another issue that I saw a lot of people doing in their notebooks was that they would have a column. They would do a transformation to that column, and then they would overwrite the original column. So if, if you are really confident that your transformation is absolutely correct and will have no problems, that's a reasonable thing to do because it saves space. But the problem is if you need to reverse the operation you just did, now you have to go back and reload the data and like do all these other things. So it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a mess. And so my recommendation there is when you're making a transformation to a column, save the transformed output as a new column. That way, if you need to make a change or go back and edit it, you can do that. Okay, so that's just an example here. I'm saving it to a new column. All right. And then now we're going to transform. We're going to change over a little bit of visualizations. Uh, let's see, it's taking a while. All right. So the usual uh, bar charts that we see by default, they're just sort of like randomly ordered categories, and sometimes they're uh, ordered alphabetically. But the most of the time, it makes sense to order them by value. So having the largest bar charts on one side ordered to the smallest on the other side, that makes it a very quick easy visual analysis to figure out where the important things, right? Which category has the most entries and which category has the least and what's the distribution of it. Okay, coming through. Right, so here, here's the, here's like the default chart, which is perfectly reasonable, right? The information is all present. But you can make it much easier to understand for your audience if you sort by value that same chart. Right, that is way easier to understand what's going on. Right? You have lost what the original order of the categories was, but that probably wasn't the important point. Maybe it is, but most of the time it's not. All right, same, just to reemphasize, same problem. I've got a bunch of data ordered alphabetically. That may or may not be a value, but look at how much different that is when I sort by the value. And this quickly picks out what's going on. Right, so this is another pretty common issue. Um, so we've got the data, it's all present. That's almost the problem itself, right? That there's too much data. And so now we have to figure out what are some alternative ways to represent this same data set in a way that's much easier to understand. Because you, you've lost all the information in this big box. So what do we do about that? Well, my, my game is just play around with different visualizations and see if anything makes a difference. So one thing that a student did I, I, I think solved the problem in some sense, almost, was the fact that they just made the picture bigger. Like, that's totally reasonable, right? And it almost accomplishes the point. Because here, for each, so we've separated the columns. But now, like, it's not clear to me how dense this line is, because all these points are still overlaid with each other. Right, so we have, to, we have to keep digging, because we've sort of solved one of the problems. One was, like, horizontal versus vertical, right? So, and we used to make the picture even bigger. but. Uh, oh, yeah. All right. So, so this plot was better, but not sufficient, in my opinion. All right. So, I think. Oh, did I not? 
Uh, I didn't even answer my own question. All right. This might not work out, so we'll see if we're going to do it live here. So, yeah, there was, uh, I think, it, oh, yeah, so I played around. And I played around with this, but I wasn't able to find one that I liked. So that's probably why it's commented out. Yeah, it's not even going to work. All right. So what I was trying to do here is to figure out, I want to see where is the average value here, right? So you could have, like, bar charts, and I think I get down to that a little bit later. But anyways, there's a different visualization to play around with. I couldn't find one that was good for that one. All right, so then uh, violin plots, um, that was pretty good. And again, the person just had this issue of overlapping axes, so they did label their axes, but then they're all scrunched together. And so you can just like make that picture bigger, and, and sometimes that works out. All right, and this, because there is only three categories here, we can actually see what the distribution is, like where the average value is, and how wide that distribution is. So. That's that's what I would want to convey in something like this because I, from this large plot, I can't see where is the average value and like where is the density of that column. Okay, I think I just have like one more. So this, I was just impressed by like GeoPandas. I haven't seen that before, so that's kind of a, a cool result. I think that's all I have for that. So yeah, playing around with visualizations takes a lot of time because there's so many things, knobs to tweak and like stories to tell. So it's it's a challenge. So we'll work on that a bit today with some activity. Base map? I don't know that one. Yeah. Yeah, let's see. All right, project two. All right. <laughs> All right, yeah, so so the project two is almost like project one with a slight twist. And so again, there's lots of data sources available uh, in the same box link. I've added a few more uh, last night, actually. And the difference here is I don't want you to use any of the project sources that were used for project one. So that means like finding it. Yes, don't use that list. So uh, and then the, the twist, that, that's not the twist, the twist is we were just doing data characterization for project one. For project two, we're going to add in a question of what do I think is going on in this data? So you have to form a hypothesis about what is what is a question that can be answered in the data. So it's not it, it's the same characterization question as before, what is in your data? But now we're forming a hypothesis about is this is a question I can answer a yes or no, is this greater than or less than that? So it's, it's just a slight addition. So we're asking two questions about our data in addition to all the characterization aspects. And we will not do presentations. There'll be a different activity in class for project two. All right, so this will be in the slides and it's on Blackboard, but this is basically the timeline. So there should be a sufficient amount of time. It's a little short on the proposal, but basically all I have to do is like find the data source and submit it. It has slightly larger size than project one, which shouldn't be too crazy, but Extend to project one. So that would violate this, this clause of not using the same data source. <laughs> if you have a different data source, then it's not really extending it. Means it's like we have done this uh, visualization and that stuff. So if we could find a question from that data supposedly and answering it. No. <laughs> if you're into like a uh, uh, cricket and you find a different cricket data set, that would be acceptable, but not the same data. And then the other twist, the excitement here is, so your project one was like your first time analyzing data. So I wouldn't want to embarrass you with posting that on the internet. But project two, I'm totally going to do that. <laughs> so, so, so there's a couple ways we can go about this, right? So like. If, if you literally have concerns about your data being posted on GitHub, I will talk with you and we'll figure out how to resolve that. But um, you won't have your name on your project, so it won't be too much of an issue. If you want your name on your project and you want to say, like, this is my portfolio, look at how much better I am than all these other students, that's a reasonable request. I can handle that. The other option that I would advocate is that you will be picking data sources that have not been previously analyzed, just like in Project 1. So, what I, which I find with everybody. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you should include um, like some links 
from there, we can find the answer. Yes. So uh, in like course materials on Blackboard, there's but a. But then they are emails, though. Like you send an email to you from the print and then you told that it, it doesn't already exist. Yes. So I, ha I haven't exhaustively made sure that all my links that I provide are not previously analyzed. Just because they're on that list does not mean that they meet the requirements. I apologize for that. Um, so the, the other thing that I was going to advertise to you is now is the time to start thinking about your portfolio of research. So when you leave here, so whoever's going to interview you for your data science position is going to ask me, can you show me the work you've done? And if you say, no, I can't, because I've never thought about that problem, right? then you have a bit of an issue. So now is the time to start thinking about what would I want to show off to a prospective employer about what my skills are. So I, I will post everyone's content to a, a website. But what I can uh, suggest is you should take your notebook, create an account on Kaggle, upload your notebook with that data source to Kaggle so that people can see the work you're doing. Right, that's, that's a little better visibility than just having it on a random website on the internet. So if you have a GitHub uh, profile, if you, if you don't have one, you should create one. If you want, you can post your notebooks there. That's totally reasonable. You can post them on Kaggle. There's lots of data science associated websites that you know, they want to be able to show off people doing work. So I would suggest, and if you want help, I can do, help you with that. OK, questions on that? So we'll take a like a six minute break. So that puts us at eight oh seven. And we'll get started with the actual lecture time.
operations. Uh, math is one of the so like three core tenets of, of data science, right? Math, programming, and some domain expertise. So I can't cover all of math in one lecture, so there will be sprinkles of math throughout the rest of the semester, but we're going to try and cover a lot of uh, content tonight. There's a lot of words in here that aren't necessarily familiar, and I probably won't be able to explain all of them to uh, everyone in the correct detail. I rely on the internet to teach you. All right, so we're going to defer a little bit. All right, so a lot of the words I've tried to in introduce the hyperlinks is basically just a bunch of Wikipedia links to get you started. And there's obviously lots of textbooks to find. So all of these different domains, all of these show up in data science. So this is basically an entire, like, from undergraduate to graduate level mathematics degree. That's what's relevant. Totally not reasonable for you to fit into your data science career, in my opinion. Right. So having at least a little bit of passing familiarity with enough math to be conversant is the goal. If someone can tell you, have you ever heard of linear algebra? You can say yes, and then ask, well, what do you know about it? I don't know. Right? But <laughs> the goal right, is that if you don't, if you literally don't know the language of mathematics, then you can't even search for that topic. So the like at best, what I hope you will leave tonight is with some additional words to do more research on. But if you don't even know those words exist, it's really hard to do the research. Okay, so I'll say I can't teach you all the math. I want to expose you to the jargon. That's this first part, just the words, and then a little bit of the concept. Why was it relevant to science? And then some examples. 
That means both hands-on examples and notebooks. So uh, I just I, I don't like it's offensive to me to talk over other people. So <laughs> <laughs> so all of these different things that you've already been doing they involve mathematics. So that's like the the interesting part is like everything that you touch like filling in data um, with the average value. Well, how do you know what an average is? You've done statistics? No, but I have some sufficient exposure to know that the average is the right thing to do in that case. Uh, right, visualization. Um, there's some mathematics in there, but it's like information density is more. I would say with that. Then this last part is uh, like the most important that we we're just talking about, Patty. Like, you have to be able to speak to your audience in a the language they're used to. So even if you do know the math, that doesn't mean that you've got the problem solved. You still have to be able to translate the concepts that you're applying in data science back to your customer, who may not be as technical as you are. So as I mentioned, there's lots of other places to get help. That's almost a problem in and of itself because there are so many. Right? If you look for a textbook on linear algebra, there's at least 100 of them. And so that means that it's now extra work to figure out which of these 100 different textbooks most naturally matches the approach that you have to learning and is at the level that you're interested in. Right? There's like different levels of the same topic, so you have to sort of figure out where you are in that problem set and also are they teaching in a format that you are interested in. And there's uh, this is like a, a little map of mathematics that's actually pretty helpful. Even though it's like a cartoon, it's actually pretty useful. Hmm? Where can I? I will send you the link. But this and it might actually be in the notes, but so this here um is I find it useful because like if you don't know that a whole domain of mathematics exists, you can't learn about it. Right, so having some map of what is all of available is interesting in my in my opinion. All right, so we're gonna jump into the, the first problem of like statistics. So has anyone here taken a statistics course? Two. All right. Three. So I will rely four. I will rely on you to call me out because I have not. All right. <laughs> all right. The goal in, in as far as I know in all of statistics is to come up with a model that tells what's going on in your data. Right, so it's like think of these two different things. You've got your data, and you've got a model about what your data is. So statistics is all about figuring out what is the model about your data, and that's a mathematical version of what is your story of the data. But so coming up with that model describing what's going on is is powerful because then you can apply those techniques to the model to tell you what's going on in your data. All right. So the first step once you've got your data is to figure out what to do with it. And you're kind of bound, and you've already seen this, right? If I have categorical data, that's different than numerical data. And the idea there is like you want to be able to figure out what is the, the description of this data. Is it numerical? And if it's numerical, is it discrete or continuous? If it's categorical, is it ordered or unordered? These are sort of like big picture questions that you should be able to answer about your data. And that the relevance here is these tell you what techniques will apply to that data set. All right, so some examples for discrete versus continuous, usually time, distance, those things we would consider continuous, in that you can make any two divisions smaller by chopping in half. So you can't do that for things like cats. Well, you can chop cats, but that's a bad idea. Coin flips, you can't do a half coin flip. It's either a coin flip or it's not. So the trick that we often apply in data science is we ignore the fact that there are continuous variables. We make them into discrete variables. My favorite example here is like an eye color. It's very, very clear from this picture that this is not blue or green or brown or yellow, right? Like those are categorical variables. But we've transformed a very, very continuous, messy problem into a categorical variable. We do this all the time. But if you saw a speed limit sign and it said 55.398, you'd be like, what is going on? <laughs> right? But we're so used to it, we don't even realize that we see speed limits in integer like integer values and not even just integers just like you know 5 or 10 15 that sort of like modular arithmetic same thing for clocks you typically don't worry about time down to the nanosecond you're like, what what minute is it if someone responded to you in something other than just hour and minute you'd be like what planet are you from <laughs> so again we do this all the time we don't even worry about it cuz it's so natural all right so now that i've armed you with a little bit of math <laughs> 
we'll go into probability. All right. So basically, probability is figuring out that model again, right? So once you've got that model, it means you can do experiments. An exper I'm using language here very intentionally. You can do an experiment and have an outcome. That's usually not sufficient. What you really want to do is a whole sequence of experiments, right? And then the question is, for those whole range of different experiments, repeating the same thing over and over, do you get the same result? And, and that's where your math skill comes in, because you want to you analyze not just the outcome of an experiment, but the outcome of a sequence of experiments. Right. Oh, yes. By the way, this is a very, very key point here. The assumption is that you can repeat the experiment, and the same experiment has a different outcome, even though you're doing the same thing, which is almost intuitively like very strange. Right? You think I'm, I'm flipping a coin. Well, why aren't you always getting heads? Well, because I'm doing slightly different things, right? But there's a little bit of randomness, but you're doing the same experiment in some sense. All right. So that brings us to a, a word that we've seen before, sort of like a distribution of results. What are the different possibilities for the outcome from my experiment? And so our, our first type of distribution, this is a sort of a heads up, there'll be more than one category of distribution. So a uniform distribution means that all the different possible outcomes have the same chance. So if I'm flipping coins, that means it's either heads or it's tails. And the probability of either of those is equal. And it's 50-50. If you're looking at what uh, type of uh, a suite of cards am I going to get back, it's going to be one of these four categories. And there's 13 cards in each category. So the chance of pulling a card from any one of these is the same. That's a uniform distribution. So you can sort of like spell all this out very quantitatively and say, for my 52 cards in the deck, hopefully everyone is familiar with a card deck. No? I thought you asked what not. What was that? I heard differently. I thought you asked who is familiar. Okay, you are, good. <laughs> All right, so in each of these, there are 13 hearts and 13 diamonds, 13 clubs, 13 spades. So the chance of pulling any one of these is equivalent to any other uh, type of card deck. All right, <laughs> no jokers. <laughs> All right, so, so you've already done this in Python. That's the amazing part, right? You didn't even know the math, and you were already doing it. So if I look at this random choice option, I'm picking these three options with equal probability. So I've got a uniform distribution. Amazing. All right. So let's see if we can get out to our notebook for week seven. Like all this getting started with random. OK, so even though you've already seen random, there's lots of other things. And so uh, with the random library, so what I'm going to show off a little bit here, and I think I've already sent this out as a either notebook or a video, is the fact that you can figure out what options are available um, from the random library. So if I run dear random, that tells me what modules are available. So if I skip past all this other stuff. We see choice and Gauss and gamma variate, expo variate, all these different distributions. So this is like a preview of like you can figure out what tools are available from your Python packages by running dir against the module, and it tells you all these different things. These happen to be relevant. Um, so, like get random, rand int, rand range, sample, shuffle, all these different tools are available to you. So, if I pick one of them and say, like, random.random, that returns me a value between 0 and 1. So, that is the starting point for almost everything. The probability of getting any one of those continuous values between 0 and 1 is uniform. All right. Then we can, we can make that a little bit. Uh, more useful if I want values between uh, 0 and 100, I just multiply it. Right? And again, I can do the same thing. So I would sort of consider that like a continuous variable, even though it's not. There is finite precision in the data. But I can do it with discrete variables also. So like I can just pick an integer. That is going to return me a uniformly distributed value, but now only 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. OK, so nothing, nothing magical that you haven't seen before. Right, I can do this also. For, it's the same idea for a list. Each of these is uniformly distributed. Uh, I think that's all I want to do. All right. I think that's all I have to show off. So I'll switch. All right. So now it's now it's your turn. So the first thing we're going to do is we collect data. 
So this is what Scotty was saying was the hardest part, right? But I've already given the tool to do it. You have a penny. <laughs> Great. So what you're going to do, if you don't have a piece of paper, I will hand out. Does anyone here need pen or paper? Okay. No, you're keeping this paper. You can put it on your computer too. Either way. Yeah, I'll be back with a thank you. Hey, for anyone else. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Start. And if you don't know how to flip a coin, I'll give a quick demo of how I flip a coin. So I have my thumb and my penny like this. So you can see that. And I flick it in the air. <laughs> and I say, there's this guy, Lincoln, on the top of the head, not Lincoln with the tail. <laughs> Ten times. So right now, the first try I got a something. There you go. I will be taking these back after class because I need it all the pennies I can get. All right, so as you're finishing up, if you've done 10 coin flips, then you can stop. There's no extra credit in, in the game. <laughs> All right, so one of my personal favorite fields in mathematics is called combinatorics. So the, the relevance of combinatorics to data science is when you're doing an experiment, you want to know what all the possible outcomes are. Combinatorics. Spells like this. I actually have it spelled. There. Combinatorics. Right. So, can we all just appreciate for one moment? So, one person in the class hadn't heard of the word that I was using. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so multiple students. So this is the value right now delivered, right? So there's a word, which is a whole, like there are seriously thousands of people in mathematics studying the field of combinatorics. There are multiple people in this class who have never heard of that word. Yes. But there's a whole, thousands of mathematicians work on that problem. It's really complicated. It's one of my favorites. Right, so what's the relevance? Okay, so the relevance of combinatorics is it tells you how many different permutations of or combinations of a thing you should expect. We just flipped a coin 10 times. How many different co coin flips could have resulted from those 10 flips? Right, so the way that we solve this is we say one flip could either be a heads or tails. Two flips could either be a heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, or tails, tails. Four possibilities, right? So we just keep going through this and we enumerate all the different permutations until we recognize a pattern. And the pattern is the number of different possible outcomes is uh, two to the number of flips. Which sounds, that's a very elegant mathematical formula. That's why people dedicate their entire life to combinatorics, right? <laughs> so for 10 flips, two to the 10, that's 1,024 outcomes. What's the consequence for this class? The consequence is, for the 25 of us, it's highly unlikely that anyone got the same outcome. Right? If, if, if one person got all heads and another person got all heads, we should just celebrate miracles. Right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's so, so highly unlikely that you probably think they did wrong. <laughs> yes, there's something happened. All right. So, and, and, and again, back to the relevance of data science, if you know how many possible permutations there are and you see something unusual, 
the reason you know it's unusual is because you know how many permutations are. And if I see everybody running around with the same license plate in my database of the license plate plates, that's highly <laughs> unlikely. Right? It means there's something wrong with the data. But I only knew that because I knew that uniform distribution for license plate numbers, right? Like that's that's sort of like the relevance here. Okay, it gets worse. And right? for 20 flips, which is something you can totally do. I'm not saying you should do 20 flips right now, but the number of permutations there is a million. That's a lot, right? So now we start needing Python, right? Because if I need to simulate what a 20 flips outcome looks like. Maybe I want to do that for all the different permutations. That's a million things. I really don't have time to do that. So this is where you, your computer skills come in handy because flipping coins all day is really boring. <laughs> all right. So which leads us to a project. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to pair you up with partners. And I'll come back to this slide uh, after we've paired you up. But basically what's going to happen is you and your partner will work on a piece of paper to figure out how to simulate all those coin flips. So the goal is you've written down a sequence of coin flips. Right? Write a Python program that finds that same sequence by randomly flipping a coin. Question? Can you please repeat it? I just heard what you said. Okay, so you flip you flip the coin ten times. You can do that in Python, not actually flipping a physical coin, but like a simulation, right? So we have this random library that I was advertising earlier. All right, I could use the random library to simulate what 10 coin flips looks like. And then I, I use my Python program to flip that Python coin 10 times. And I ask, was that sequence of outcomes that I got the same as what I did physically? And the answer probably is going to be no. So now I have to do 10 more experiments and flip the Python coin 10 times. And I say, is that sequence the same as what I did? <laughs> <laughs> right. So your your computer's gonna do a lot of work. Hopefully you won't do quite as much as the as the computer, but you'll be writing some code with your partner. So what I recommend to you is as a partner with that person. I'm just trying to understand this great. So like we're counting how many flips it takes to find exactly this sequence. That's right. Oh, okay. See, I'm not the only one who's doing that. That's right. That's why you speak up and now everyone else has the same question. It's a miracle. All right. That's not a coincidence, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to pair you up. If you still have questions about this, I will be wandering around, and you can certainly like bug me, and I will come over. Uh. All right. <laughs> All right. No. Okay. Partners, who's who we got? Ah, oh, Paris isn't defined. Oh. oh, I know, right? Everybody said. Oh, wait, here's why. I had everybody comment it out. Right. Sorry. This is me not cleaning up for myself last time. Oh, syntax error. A bug. ODEF, that's probably the problem right there. There we go. All right. Make that a little bigger. Again, if you need paper to write down your design, I have lots of paper. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. I will take your coins. I'll wander on. But
Okay, we're going to call a halt, and you're going to go back to your desk. You, I mean, you can certainly keep working on this problem outside of class, but I'm going to stop you now on this problem here. Yes. So you have to stop and go back to your desk. As exciting as this problem is. <laughs> I'm enjoying the fact that everybody gets more excited to finish. Like they're not going to finish the problem. Trust me. Not now. <laughs> not in the next 20 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so just like not to like whack you up, but like I think I had one student one semester had like a five line solution, so I do not have a five line solution. I'm not that good, but <laughs> it is possible to be quick. All right, so I'm gonna walk through a solution that I came up. It's super naive. Naive isn't a bad word itself. Naive just means it's like like a, a quick guess about what the solution is. So the solution I'm not going to show you is not the right one. It's just the first thing that I came up with, and it's probably overly long. Right? It's very complicated because it's how I was thinking at the time. So this is maybe a reflection of my programming skill. All right. So I'm going to import the random sequence, uh, the random library, and then the first thing I need to do is I need to write down what is the sequence of coin flips that I had. So I'm going to comment out. I think I had like a, a longer sequence here. Let me just get back to a real one. Uh, 13? Sure. Okay. So I'm going to skip over this. Uh, well, yeah, okay. So the first thing that I do, I need to create a random sequence. So I'm gonna, I have a sequence that I started with, like physically coin flip. And then I have a function that's going to get me a new sequence. So the relevance there is I'm going to call this function over and over and over until I find a match. So this sequence, I take two arguments. The first is how long of a sequence am I caring about? In the case of the work you're doing, it would be 10. And then this is a, a, a variable here to track how many coin flips I've done so far. And so you'll notice that variable is what I'm increasing as I flip coins. So I have some initial number of coin flips I've done so far historically. And then as I flip the coin, I'm just incrementing this inside this loop. The other thing that this uh, loop here is, is just flipping between 1 and 2. So I'm treating that as my heads and tails. You don't actually have to have an H or a T or the word heads or tails spelled out. So I'm just using the values 1 and 2. And I'm getting back a value in my variable called coin. So my value here will either be 1 or 2. All right. I'm going to build a list. The list is the sequence I'm going to compare against. I have the list that I actually flipped and the list that I generated in Python. And those are the two things I want to compare. So I built this list by just saying like this run out of 10 and then the value of the coin. So that's all this function does. It does my virtual coin flips however many times I needed to. All right, questions on this function so far? That's just like a building block. So to show you like how that runs, I can get uh, I gotta run this. There we go. Okay, so I put in, I want a sequence of length five, and I haven't done any coin flips historically. I'm going to store the two variables I get back out, how many coin flips have I done now, and what is the result. So I got back the sequence of heads, tails, 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 tails. Um, I would doubt how the two variables start getting stored in the experiment is that it can running count. How are they being set? Um, I'm not able to understand this thing. So, so my function took two variables and I returned two variables. Hmm. And those two variable outputs, those are being stored to the two variables here. And what's the value of both the running count and experiment? Yeah. So I'll, I'll put in an extra line here. Fine. 
because I, I had historically I had zero coin flips after I made this sequence. Now I've had five coin flips. In the same order, it will return to the Okay, yeah, the return statement number of arguments needs to match the output number of arguments. Good question. All right. So now I've got that. If I run it again, I get a different sequence. Now we get into the mess. Again, this is probably over convoluted, but it's just me sort of like demonstrating what I wrote the first time. So I have my, my primary variable of interest up here is the number of coin flips. That's going to be my count. And then I'm going to have a list for every simulation that I'm doing of 10 coin flips, let's say. Now, this is something you might not have seen before, while true. So it's an infinite loop. It will never stop executing. It'll just keep going over and over and over, because it's always going to, that while condition is always true, so the loop never ends. That's magic, right? We'll, we'll figure out what happened there. All right, so then I just went over this function with you. So I, I want to simulate however many um, coin flips I have in my original sequence, I'm going to store the results there in those two variables, so just like we showed in the previous cell. Now I've got the sequence I care about and the sequence I generated, and I want to compare those. So I'm going to set a Boolean variable called found match. I have not found a match, so the value is false, just like keeping track of where I am in my head. And then I'm going to have a loop here. This loop is the important part. So the loop says, for every element in those two lists, Compare them. All right, so I have to go over all the indexes in the list, and then I compare element by element. So again, this is very, very brute force. It says, is this element the same as this one? Is this element the same as this one? Is this one the same as this one? And so by that comparison, either we will find that they always match element by element, or at some point, maybe those two sequences don't align, which is most often the case, and then we'll say our match equals false. And we know we can stop working if we found that the sequence doesn't match at some point. You can just like terminate this loop. So that's where this break statement applies. This break is saying, leave the for loop once you've found that the sequences don't match. Don't just finish the for loop. All right, so after we finish this search of the two sequences, then we can ask, did we find a match? If that was true, that means that this value was always set here and we never reached into this else statement. And so if that is true, then we say print the, the result. We found a match, stop. Right? And we can break out of that while loop. That's how we're getting out of the infinite loop. The reason I was using an infinite loop is because I actually don't know how many loop iterations I need to make. I just need to keep searching until I find a match. So the break statement here is paired with this while loop to say exit the while loop once you found a match. OK, so then we can say number coin flips because we've kept track of that. All right, so for this sequence of, I think, 13, so the initial sequence that I was looking for is 13 long. And all of that Python code executed in 0.84 seconds. That's really fast, right? Especially impressive because we did 110,000 point flips to find a sequence that was that long. All right. Exactly. That is, that's the goal, right? Python did some magic, and we can make this even worse, right? So like, let's say like there's 18. Remember how quickly that blows up. Yeah, this is taking a long time. I wonder why it's so hard, right? Like, we're going to get back the count of how many coin flips there were. So in 6.7 seconds, it did 1.7 million coin flips. Woo! Can you imagine doing 1.7 million coin flips? It's a lot, right? All right. I think that's it. Yeah, oh. Now here's the, here's the cool part. I mean, <laughs> all right. So I'm going to go to a website, and hopefully this blows your minds. Because this blew my mind when I first saw it. Uh, and obviously, this will be in the in the uh, in the notes. So there's this web page. It has this like blank template of stuff going on here. Right. So I'm going to copy. I, this is just all the source code for the code that I just talked about. I'm going to put it in this. Oops. Not that. Copy. Not that copy. Um, yes. Okay. So I'll just put all the code in this web page. It's 3.6. I'm going to visualize the execution. All right. So this web page is super cool. And uh, hopefully it helps you make more sense of the code that you write, because it's very helpful to walk through. 
So what the pit web page did is in the background, it went and executed in advance all of this code and then said, how many steps did that take? All right, so there's 100, or 310 steps. I'm not going to step all the way through it, but hopefully you get enough of the idea. So I move forward, and basically it says that the green arrow is the line that just executed. So that first line is import random. So what we see over here on the right-hand side is there's a thing called a frame, and it has the word random, and it did something. All right, not too clear yet what was going on. Second line executed. Second line is called sequence of interest. That's the thing I'm trying to match. It has four values. Now we just created a new thing called the sequence of interest, and it points to this other structure with the one, two, one, one. All right, let's we'll step again to the next line. Print. That doesn't create anything in memory, so we're not going to get anything out of that. A definition. So now we have, we just executed line five, and that shows up um, as a function here that's pointing to this thing. Still not too clear what's going on, maybe. Okay, now we create a new variable. Right, so Python is just being executed line by line, it's like normal, but we're seeing what happens in memory. So we execute line 13 because that was the next thing in the sequence with execution, and now we see a new variable is point, uh, new created, and it's got nothing in it. We create a list, right? So it's going through step by step. What's going on in memory? We're just creating all these values. While true, that doesn't put anything in memory. Now it just creates, now it ran this function, right? So we're creating a random sequence. It goes back up there and says, what do I do next? Well, let's move forward. So now we've got this run. You'll notice this is a slightly different block of code because in memory, it is separate from the global memory. And so this, this set of values here, these are specific to that function, that's the scope. And that scope is not shared with what's up in the global memory space. Okay, now the fun part begins. So we're in a for loop. We run the, the, the coin flip, and we get back a value. And then we just incremented this value. That would flip from 0 to 1. Right, so we can see that the variable value changed. Now we start creating a new list with a single value, which was coin. Now we run that over and over and over. We're building a list in memory. Now we return back to the original body with two variables. And now everything's back in main memory. All right. Yeah, exactly. But in memory variable tracking with. So. All right. We got one cool. That's all I was looking for. <laughs> now I can move on. All right. So basically, yeah. So, I think go. What's your question? We created a for loop just to do the object to randomly get the list. Like, do that. Yes. And then you kept on doing the for loop. Well, no, so let me go back. I was stepping line by line through that for loop. So I had this, I had to iterate four times through the for loop. That's why it's so many steps. So I build that list line by line, and then I return that back to main memory. Not sure if that was true. All right. So then I've got all this variable tracking. I'm not going to step all the way through the sequence. There's a lot of like tracking, but hopefully the point is that you can take this website and track what is going on in your code. Why is it doing what it's doing? What's what's like my mental model of what's happening? It's all displayed on this lovely web page. There is a Python debugger, and we will cover it, but this is not it. <laughs> okay. So hopefully that was enough teaser to get you to understand why you, this website's cool, and then you can go track it on yourself. Oops, I'm running out of that. All right, let's go back to... All right. So now I'm going to take a break from teaching. Because it's back on you. So hopefully people with I think is it A through K last name? Yeah, great. So you uh, looked at a Python notebook or A through J, I bet. A through J last name. You looked at a Python notebook, yes? No? Mm -hmm. Yes? Awesome. So you're gonna find someone who has the opposite sort of uh, 
range of last names, A to C, and talk to that person about the notebook that you read about. So this is, I'm not assigning random pairs. You have to find a person who didn't, uh, wasn't assigned this test.
I'm going to give you a break. You can continue talking if you want. We're going to be on break until 9.07.
Until 907. <laughs> That's why no one else is here. sheet of paper. On that small sheet of paper, in the upcoming slides, you will be drawing a little graph on that piece of paper. I do not need that little one back. The larger half sheet that says question and learn, that one is for your anonymous feedback for you to turn into me at the end of class. So I want to know what question do you have and what did you learn. So one sentence each, please. Okay, I'll remind you at the end of class, I'm not collecting the small ones. You're going to draw a little graph. The question and learn, I will take back. I don't want your name on it. Okay, so up until now, we've almost exclusively been looking at what are two outcome uh, experiments, so like coin flips. But obviously, there are other experiments that you can do where there's like a whole range of different outcomes. Those can also be uniform. Typically, the, the shared characteristic of a uniform distribution is that if you plot, plot a bunch of experiments and you, you have uh, the outcomes here, It'll be flat. So uni think uniform distribution, flat set of results because they're all the same equal probability. All right, that's the takeaway there for the last hour of our life. There's a different curve, the bell curve. Who here has heard of the bell curve? Yeah. So a lot of people, not everyone, but this is shaped like a bell, hence the name. Right. So there's lots of other names for it, but we'll get to. Basically, the, the important features here to think of is that. In the middle of this distribution, most people 
or most you know, results fall, fall in the middle of our distribution. The average is in the middle, and then you have some outliers. So there's a whole bunch of words associated with just this curve. The fancy math words, right? We just use bell curves. That's not a fancy math word. The fancy math words are Gaussian distribution and binomial distribution. So there's a whole bunch of like explanation of what's going on here, but you can think of it as back to that discrete versus continuous measurement. So if you have a whole bunch of measurements like coin flips, that would be like a discrete event, whereas you can have the continuous distribution like a temperature or a time or a distance. So all of these, um, that's just the relation back to the concept that we're looking at. Okay, now here's like the, the mind-blowing part. <laughs> so you can use coin flips and build a binomial distribution. That's crazy, right? Because like, we were just looking at it as a uniform distribution. So like what is going on here? All right, so let's let's go into this. All right, so we just looked at uh, one experiment of coin flips, and what's the distribution of heads and tails for that? It's uniform. All right, what did I call this one? Binomial, obviously. So here, um, I'm going to do a slight, uh, slightly more complicated experiment with that same set of coin flips. Make this all bigger. So I'm again. I'm going to flip the coin uh, like ten times, right? And that returns some number of heads and some number of tails. The difference is I'm going to repeat that experiment many, many times. All right. So I'm going to I'm going to do a thousand coin tosses in each trial. I'm going to do a thousand trials. So that's slightly different than what we were just doing. That difference is why we're looking at these different distributions. All right. So let's see. Yeah. Um, I'll we'll just draw that out there. All right. So just like last time, I can flip a coin of this a thousand times and I get back some number of heads. So that's pretty similar to what we did. All right. So I'm going to probably skip this list comprehension section in the interest of time. You can come back to it. Um, oh, wow. All right. Did I cut it off again? I have to go through this. So, so basically, we're going to flip the coin a thousand times and then do that a thousand times. And um, let's see. Yeah. Shift, enter, shift, enter, shift, enter. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, in the end, basically, I'm going to get back a list of how many times I got a heads, or if you think of what a tie fails, right? So the first 10 entries in my total cumulative results look like this. So the first time I flipped 1,000 coins, I got back 499 heads. Then I flipped a coin 1,000 times again, and I got back 494 heads. And then I flipped another 1,000 coins, and I got back 517 heads. See what's going on here? But I did this. A thousand times. I'm only showing you the first ten, but there's a thousand of these. Okay. So now let's look at the histogram of that. Ms. Slant, happy? List of trial results. Did I spell it wrong? Oh, I didn't execute. <laughs> okay. Right. So that looks way different because we're plotting something that is different. So we're asking how many times did I get ahead? Usually, it was 500 times I got that because I did a thousand coin flips and the coin was fair. But sometimes, like when I did it in my experiment, it wasn't all, no, it wasn't half heads and half tails. There were like 480 uh, heads and 520 tails. Right, so this is a slightly different picture of the same coin flips in an experiment. How many people have lost so far? No one? Okay. <laughs> I'm impressed. Again. Yeah. How does Bell calculate that 500 is the maximum How Bell is like that smart? Why is it that way? Huh. Incrementing and at this level. Yeah, so this. There is just behind it or just randomly taken? Well, so, so every outcome was random. But what we're, lo what we're using here is called the law of large numbers. So you did an experiment, on average, that result is something. 
right? But sometimes it's not the result exactly 50 50 for the differential. Sometimes there are 480 heads and 520 tails. And sometimes there are 520 tails and vice versa. So on average, most of the results came back fair. But some, some results didn't look like that. But there's the law of large numbers. That's what the mathematical reason for that is. It's centered on the average. But there's some variance to it. This, this, so again, this is a distribution of outcomes. But there, and there's some width to it. So it's not. So you won't get exactly everything was 500. That'd be unusual, right? Yeah. I'm not sure that I answered that well, but no, there's more words. Exactly. Okay. There's some width. Okay, so again, this is the default histogram with 10 bins, and you know you can change that by setting the number of bins to be different. So, and here I've constrained the, the axes, but basically it's that same shape of a bell curve. Um, and so you can do more and more experiments and get a nice smooth curve, but this is what we have with a thousand trials of a thousand coin flips each. That's a, a lot. All right, so I've just showed you matplotlib, that's like the baseline. There's some fancier pictures if you use Seaborn. Seaborn um, tries to fit that distribution of the curve. So it tries to smooth it out for you. Uh, I think that's it. Yeah. OK. Questions on that? So that's the name of the library. Uh, I don't know the origin of why it's called Seaborn. I don't have an answer on that one. I can I can put that in my list. If you write that down as a question, I will answer it. <laughs> All right. That that just becomes that that's the default for dist plot. So like distribution plot, but automatically does that in the background. This notebook will be available as part of the bulletin blackboard. Okay. So basically, the difference between these two, this is the outcome for a single experiment. And if you take that experiment and you do it many, many, many times, sometimes you'll get a very even split of 50-50. Sometimes it'll be lopsided. But more often, it'll be a fair point. So this is the issue there. All right. All right. So the issue here is like, if you notice, when you run this experiment once, you'll get back one result, and then maybe not even the match. And you rerun that same notebook, and you'll come back, and it'll be a slightly different result. Right? And so there's some like movement around there every time you do the experiment differently. Right? <laughs> that was my dance. <laughs> what you're really observing here is a different outcome in this distribution. So how much, right, back to that question of like the width of this curve, that's the variance of that value. Like how much it will go up and down, that's the width here. OK. So. The larger the number of times um, let's see, is that true? I'll have to think. I don't know the answer. I'll come back to that. I think the answer is no. The, the, shape, the shape of the distribution should remain constant. The variance doesn't change. That's a true statement. OK. Basically, there's some values to, to, to know how wide is that distribution. The name of that is the variance. You may have heard of the standard deviation. Okay, so getting back to like when you have that single bar chart on the left side here, there's some uncertainty in what the actual value is if you did it an infinite number of times. And so how much variation there is depends on how many times you experiment. Maybe that answers it. So basically, you can measure the width of this curve. These are called confidence interval. So there's a bunch of names to throw around there. Right. So I'm going to skip over this part and get to over correlation time series. All right, so I skipped over a little bit. We'll come back to it in the next lecture. That's the part you wanted? Yeah, I'm just like, that's kind of important stuff. It is, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but in order to do the homework, I need to show you this next section. <laughs> it's a very strong argument. All right, so uh, as Patty mentioned, getting the data is the hard part. Right? The other hard part is understanding the data. Like, what? Just because you have a CSV and you know that it's dirty, how to clean it often depends on the people that you're talking to. So like getting not only the data, but the story behind the data, that's also important. 
Um, so once you have this dirty data that you're looking at, you have to understand what is it trying to tell you. And what that really means is what's the relationships between the variables in the data. So again, I talk to people. That's how I wrote. I, I, I talk to people about data like this. So this is power data. So has anyone seen one of these? It's called electrical substation. Yes. Okay. So electrical substations, they're useful because they supply your house and the school occasionally with power. Right? That's like the UMBC joke for tonight is occasionally we get power. All right. So what I try and do as a data scientist is I try and understand, I try and make a prediction about what is in the data. And the way that I do this, I think about if I have a plot, a visualization, and I draw that, that visualization before I've even looked at the data, right? I've not opened up the CSV. I try to think about what is the relationship in that data, usually often based on my own experience or based on talking to people. What should I expect from the data? So if I have two axes, time and power, Right? And I'm going to say this is the power for all of you in DC. Right? So what I want you to do on your little little sheets of paper, draw this picture, and tell me what this plot looks like. I haven't shown you any data, so you obviously have no idea what the right answer is. So time, day, month. That, I haven't told you that. Okay. Right? It, it, it meant it depends, right? So well, not random. You know that you're a human and that you live in a building that has power, and sometimes the lights are on and sometimes the lights are off. So it's not a completely random guess. Right? You have experience in this in this field. You're not a domain expert, but you have exposure to the domain. Are you talking about how we do? Yes. How yes. Or like, like the campus. I'm going to set the scope for uh, UMBC campus. Okay, so I'm gonna give you like one or two minutes to like think and draw. Right, so for someone who has drawn, can someone tell me what time scale they were operating on? What was it? What was the time scale on here? Um, okay, so we've got days and hours. And what, what what can someone describe the shape that they had on their plot? What was the shape of this plot? <laughs> I'm just saying what I heard. Okay, tell me more. Uh, up, down. Up. Up. <laughs> No, no, okay. Everybody's laughing, but there's a serious question here. Why do you think that? Well, I guess that my so, uh, when the day starts, at that time there won't be any light. Uh, okay. Then all the campus will be uh, okay. light will be off. And mm -hmm. then in the day, in the whole day time, it will be on. And at night, again, it will be. Awesome. I love that story. Did anyone hear that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so, so let me. I'm going to smooth this out a little bit, right? So I'm going to draw something that looks like this. And the reason I'm doing that is because not everyone turns on their lights at the exact same time, right? Like everyone's not waiting for 8 a.m. or something. And so like here, a few people have turned on the lights, more people have turned on the lights, more people have turned on the lights. They, most people have turned on the lights, right? It's during the day, so maybe we should make this a little bit longer. And then it comes back, it's the afternoon, evening, people are leaving, right? Now here's the key part. You said that the next day it happens again, yeah. right? So if, if you didn't draw that, let me know and we can talk about why. But that was sort of like, you have never probably managed one of these optical substations, but somehow, based on your personal experience, you knew what the answer was before we've even looked at the data. Straight out amazing. I mean, all right, I'm not gonna do that, and then we're gonna do this. So I happen to suspect that I might run out of time tonight. So there's a very, very long video of like 10 minutes that goes through a whole sequence of notebooks. I'm going to cut right to the punchline so we can move on to the part that's important. So 
in this notebook, I load in a CSV from a website. And if you've ever met me, I'll tell you why this problem is uh, <laughs> common to me, I guess. So I, I found this website. It has the electrical power for an entire, I think it's like a, a country. Anyways, all the power for a country. Right? And they plot it on a web on a web page in a little diagram for you. Isn't that amazing? Right? And I was a data scientist, like, but I want to play with the data. <laughs> right? Obviously. So they happen to have all this table here. Great. But that's not all the data. Oh, here's a CSV. I'll download the CSV. Of course that's what Ben would do. Right? Okay, so <laughs> that's the setup. All right, so I've downloaded the CSV from this website for some range of time, and I happen to learn through a long exploration of this data that these are the right things I need to pass to Canvas. I need to skip the first line, I need to skip the last name, uh, the last line, I need to specify a header, and I'm not using their index. So once you learn all that, and I'd recommend watching the YouTube video because it's a lot of fun. Can I not load Canvas? All right, so there's what the data looks like. Super exciting, right? So we've got a bunch of numbers and more numbers. That's why the data science is so uh, And these happen to look like years and months and days and hours and minutes and seconds. But they are actually. And this is the amount of power that the country is using. Exactly. All right. Now we've got someone paying attention. <laughs> so it happens to be that I have to convert that entire column of strings into a date time, and then I can plot it. Guess what the plot looks like? Isn't that interesting? I mean, like, you guys knew what the answer was before even seeing the data. Mm -hmm. Think of how powerful that would be if you made a prediction about what the data should look like and then realized there's a bug in this data because it doesn't look like what I expected. Either I need to fix my understanding or fix how the data is analyzed. That's very powerful. Now, if you're really curious, so I'm not going to make you guess. I'll just tell you the quick answer. So these are the daily spikes, right? So just like we drew, we have like a, a low peak and then it goes up. Somebody goes to lunch, and they come back to lunch, and then they go back to bed, and they go to work, and they come back, and blah, blah, blah. Now, you'll notice there's this weird pattern of, like, on a daily cycle, but then these two are lower than the other ones. And they have weekends. Weekends. All right. And if you really want, I'm not going to tell you to do it right now, but it happened if you look up 2019, uh, March 3rd and 4th, that is a better Sunday. Awesome. All right. And this must be a warm Perhaps. <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right. So now we're going to do a, another quick activity. It will take five minutes. I'm going to finish this before we do it, uh, the homework, and then uh, we'll come back and talk about the homework. Okay. So I'm going to, let's see. So the other person that you talk to, like you're going to come back to that same pair. All right. So one of you have already talked about. Uh, was it the visualizing of the uniform data? This is another notebook that the other person was supposed to have read. You already did that? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Moving on. All right. So I'm going to use group. So now that you've learned group by, I'm going to use group by. And this is like, <laughs> I don't know. I, I hate to say like my favorite notebook, but like this is one of the fun ones that I was able to discover in preparing for this class. All right. So it turns out you have a web browser and you've probably browsed the internet. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> yes. Okay. So it turns out that your history is stored in a database on your computer. Oh, haha! Now we know where Ben's going, right? <laughs> All right. So it turns out in my computer, this is where Chrome stores its file, and Chrome happens to store its history in an SQL database. But you didn't know that. All right. So. So let's take a look at what that does. So I'm going to load in pandas, and I'm going to load in a new library that you may not have exposed to before called SQLite 3. That's pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> All right. So, what we're, so the file that I've uh, copied from my Chrome history is called, not surprisingly, history. It's really exciting. Um, and I'm going to use this library called SQLite 3 to connect to that file, and I get back a variable of the type SQLite Super straightforward. So now we've established this data, this connection with a remote database on my computer. All right, we have to go through a bunch of shenanigans, which I will skip for two reasons. I don't understand it, being the first. <laughs> um, 
So Google Chrome, for whatever reason, has its timestamps uh, since January 1st of 1601. I don't know why they didn't. Okay, so, so there's some shenanigans that you get to do with SQLite to convert that timestamp into what should be uh, a better timestamp. In the end, let's get back to what's real. So I get back to the data frame here with the timestamp and the website that I visited. Hopefully none of these are naughty. Um, we'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> I will not be posting my Chrome history to the Blackboard. All right. <laughs> All right. So here's here's like the bad thing, right? So we have twenty two thousand rows in this data. That's a lot of websites. This is how Google gets all the data. They have a web browser that they've produced. <laughs> Amazing, all right. So then unfortunately, if you look at the bottom of that data frame, some of the date times didn't convert. So like these are sixteen hundred December thirty first. That's a long time ago. I wasn't actually alive, neither was my computer. <laughs> So we know there's a there's something wrong with the data, right? We have to fix it. So it turns out these are right now being stored as strings. So I have to convert those strings into timestamps. So I'm gonna like this is this is me showing that I really do have strings, and that I have to convert that into a timestamp. So I'm gonna do that. There's a special trick you can call errors covers. I mean, like if you run into an error when you're trying to convert this string into a date time, screw it, right? Like skip it. All right, so what's to happen? So, so we get back the thing we expected, but then at the bottom we get these NATs, not a time. Interesting. All right. So as as was very uh, consistent with the the projects. So I'm just going to leave these NATs in there. Like it turns out for the rest of my analysis, it's cool that they're NATs, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't break for the rest of my analysis, so I'm just going to leave them in there. So I have a max and min time, so that's sort of like the date range. Notice it goes from 2018 to 2019. I'm gonna have to deal with years. So is that because the like I think it ages off. I've had this for like 10 years, so everyone from them. So then I'm gonna check just before I do my analysis how many NATs exist in my data frame. And the answer is 30. So at this point, I'm gonna declare a victory because 32 or 30. Not eight times out of a database of 22,000. I don't care. It's noise. All right. If it were large, maybe it would worry. But at this point, I'm just going to go straight to plotting the data. All right. So if you've read about group by, then you can hopefully see what's going to happen here. So I take my column. I'm going to group by the month in that column. All right. And I'm going to plot uh, the count for that month. So th again, a little bit of trickery here. I'm going to leave this notebook up in Blackboard so you can analyze it. The idea is I'm going to get how many websites that I visit per month. Seven, eight, nine, ten. So it's uh, July, August, September, October. So this is like is crazy, right? Like eight, eighty-five hundred or almost nine thousand websites in one month. Is that even realistic? Like I, I'm online a lot, but okay. So eighty-five hundred divided by thirty days in a month. That's about two hundred eighty websites on a given day. <laughs> All right. <laughs> exactly. All right. So you might enjoy running the same notebook against your history. Maybe not. So when the AFC browser just I think it's gone. I think I think it's gone from your your database. Yeah. Okay. So what's what what little trick here? Um, you might not have noticed. It was important to look at the, the, the year because it went from 18 to 19. Right? And so that means when we were looking at the month by month data, this was actually October of 2018 and October of 2019, which isn't what we meant. Right? So that means what we really want to do is two group bys grouping by the month and grouping by the year, and then plotting that as a histogram. And this, this leaves me a little confused as to why Chrome has my. Browsing history from October 2019 and October 2019, but for whatever reason. So, this is actually the real data because I've broken it out by year and month. That made more sense. So, I previously just had month, 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 month. Here I have year, month, year, month, year, month, year, month. That's my categories. Okay. So, still, uh, was that September was a busy month. All right. All right. So, now we can go into looking at different things like the day of the month. 
here, this plot, I would argue, isn't actually that useful. Because if you look at, there's no sort of like reasonable pattern to pick out. It wouldn't make sense that I browse more websites on the first of the month versus the third of the month. Like, there's not really a good pattern there. So this plot, although you can do it, it's not super relevant because there's not a story here to tell. So this next one, we break out by um, month and day. Right? So month and day is more meaningful. It's actually the number of websites I visit on a given month. I think I didn't include the year. It's not quite accurate. But the point is, so this is like my browsing count history by day of month. Makes sense. Okay. So here you can start to pick up patterns like where are the weekends and where are the weekdays, right? So like I'm not going to try and answer that immediately, but you can sort of start to pick out pick out which is Saturday and which is Sunday. Okay. And I think my last one is my favorite. So. Here I've done just the same group by operation, but this time by hour. Right, so my hourly browsing history count, um, right, localized time. So here's midnight. There were no entries for 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m. That's good. I sleep during the hours. Four and five. I don't know what was going on there. <laughs> Six and seven a.m. I'm waking up. That's something early for some of you, right? Okay, so obviously I go to work and I do some stuff, and then I come home six and seven. I'm I'm eating dinner or I'm sleeping or so I'm getting uh, home from work, and then here I'm preparing for class, and then I go to bed. Right, so that's a <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's my Chrome browsing history as a group by exercise. All right. All right. All right, so not part of this exercise, but as you've seen before, the number of uh, uh, bins matters. See, so, yeah, I think I'm going to skip ahead to the next operations. Uh, all right. All right, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip through the visualization section, and we'll come back to it next week. Homework. All right. I'll let you read this, but I'm going to highlight it for you. That same website that I just showed you, you're going to have to go get some more data from that website. Uh, I'd have to look. I think it's either like Scotland or England or somewhere. Small country. All right. So basically, the idea is you're going to take the data that I showed you and combine it with the techniques I showed you from the Chrome browser, right? With group files. Those are basically that's the homework. Mash up those two. <laughs> Yeah. Way that I just to it. Yeah. I think there's one more assignment and we'll move on to that one quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Right. I've trained you guys to do one. All right, so here we've been working with fair coins, right? And luckily we didn't have any unfair coins, like that have like a 40 60 distribution. More commonly, I'll see an unfair dice. So I roll a die and it doesn't show up one, two, three, four, five, six all the time. Right? Maybe it shows up two more often. So that'd be a weighted die if you've ever seen that. So this is that idea of like, how would you differentiate a fair die from an unfair die? Agreed. This is slightly more complicated. Yeah, we can do that. Item, but I'll right. Good I'll question. <laughs> I'll tell you, it's still in the random library. There's an opportunity in the random library to do that. <laughs> so this is your like we have one minute while everybody's sitting here. If you have questions about either of these homeworks, so the random die or a time series bar chart group by operation, if you ask now. I might be able to reveal an answer to everyone in class. So, like, so for 10 days, we have to. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, for 10 days, we have to. Uh, we have to 
download the data. Yes. When? Uh, Tuesday of next week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it could be like from last year. You don't have to wait for 10 days for the data. So basically, uh, when you're expecting waiting for the number of days, it's like let's say 10 days, so you're expecting 40 days. Yes. Thank you. What you're expecting, what you're expecting. Alright. So one chart is of hours. Did I say hours? One bar chart has 24 times the number of days. So this is what I would advocate, right? Draw a picture of what you think you're gonna draw. So let's say I have 10 days, right? That's 24 times 10 would be 240. And that was a bar chart. Right? So it's going you know, to look something, I don't know what your data will look like, but there's going to be 240 bars on this axis. That's one of them. So this is a bar graph. There are 24 times the number of days, or 10 days at least, so that's 240 bars. So that how much energy was used on each day? Um, and each hour of each day. Yep. Did that answer the question? Okay, the other one is more slightly different. Time. Well, and there's only going to be 24 bars for 24 hours. That's going to be from that same 10 days. So you're going to have to average what was the average power on at 4 a.m.? What was the average power at 5 a.m.? What was the average power at 6 a.m.? Right. Yes. So two bar charts. No number of bars. Yeah. So it's just the hourly power consumption. What are you missing? Absolutely. 1042 and you're totally gone, right? Thank you.